Good evening, it's June 2nd. I'm Arno Grunberg, an author and welcome in the Bali. Also to those of you who are watching this from their homes, their bathrooms, their swimming pools or their saunas. Today, uh, this event is basically on the occasion of the Dutch publication of Philip Müller's book, Zonderbehandlung, Three Years in the Gas Chamber. And uh, because of this, I will talk with uh, Piotr Szewinski, whom I'm going to introduce to you in a second. But first, a bit about what you can expect in the uh, next 90 minutes or so. Um, as I said before, there is this conversation. There will be uh, some excerpts from the book, read by the actress Anne van Veen in English. Although I have to say, uh, and um, without any prejudice, of course, that the Dutch translation is much better. Um, also, there will be two uh, video um, excerpts, and then at the end of the event, you, uh, people in the audience, can ask questions, but as you might know, I'm quite strict. The question uh, doesn't last longer than 30 or 45 seconds. And if you want to express opinions, personal anecdotes, or anything that uh, comes close to it, you can do so, but later in the bar. Um, Piotr, we agreed to say Piotr. I'm going to introduce you, and if you disagree with anything I'm saying, just interrupt me. Good evening. Piotr Szewinski is a Polish historian and since 2006 the director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. Born in 1972 in Warsaw, Poland, Szewinski has dedicated his career to preserving the memory of the Holocaust and promoting education about the crimes committed at Auschwitz. Szewinski studied history at the University of Humanities in Strasbourg and at the Catholic University of Lublin, specializing in medieval history. In 2001, he obtained his PhD degree at the Institute of History of the Polish Academy of Science. He is the author of numerous books and articles about the Holocaust and memorials. In his publications, he also addresses contemporary issue, issues related to racism, racism anti-Semitism and human rights, drawing connections between the past and the present. In his role as director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, he has focused on maintaining the authenticity of the camp's structures, artifacts and archives, ensuring that future generations can learn from the Holocaust. About the role of the museum, Chavinsky stated, our moral obligation, the reason for this place, is to warn, to warn men of himself. You agree more or less? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to start, we might have to explain a bit uh, of things that, that of course are well known to you and to some people in the audience, but before we start, I'd like to ask you something about where you live, because you live partly in Warsaw, but also you live in Auschwitz, in the camp itself. And about this, you wrote something in um, your book Epitaph, um, which really surprised me. I'd like to, to read a quote to you. You write, once you set Auschwitz straight in your mind, if you not so much live with it as because of it, then there's no turning back. Nothing will cut it out of my conscience even if I change jobs. Apart from exceptional cases and those who run away very fast after barely a few months, generally one never leaves Auschwitz. Yes, of course. Like General, what, what, what do you mean by that? N you never leave Auschwitz. You know, uh, ha, uh, when you are involved in Auschwitz, deeply involved, that means that you are going there nearly every day. You are working only in this place. You are working with this place. You are explaining that place. You are uh, discussing it. It's happened less and less, but with survivors, we are, uh, I don't know, discussing with, with young people, new generations. Uh, it starts to be not only an enormous part of yourself, but also a sort of lens to, 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 to see the, the today's world also, the, the today's, let's say, drama, the today's, I don't know, uh, tasks, the today's dangers that you, you, you can feel. Uh, you know, there's no curricula that you have to f to follow. What, what you what you can be after after 17 years of of, uh, of serving as, as a director of Auschwitz? Uh, I think it's it's 
it's something more than a job. It, 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 I understand that that's like a sort of mi mission. And when I started to to to, to work in, in Auschwitz, you know, one of the drivers of the museum was coming to me, and he said, "You know, Mr. Director, I could certainly earn more money." two times or three times more money if I will be a driver on some big uh, tiers, you know, uh, uh, around Europe. Uh, so I, I could be a driver somewhere else, but I will never be the same driver that I am here. So if a driver understands this, you can imagine how... Uh, it is for the director. Yeah. yeah. Would you, say, you mentioned the word mission. Um, you say you never leave Auschwitz. Is it, is it like an exaggeration if I say that where you are, there is Auschwitz? It's always, Because you are here, we of are... Of course, uh, after all those years, it's, it's every time with me. Uh, you know, and, and we, when we are speaking with some other colleagues, it's not a very big number of people around Europe who, who are working in some memorials after the Shoah or after the concentration camps. Uh, we understand us immediately. We have we have the same, let's say, perspective of uh, it's a, it's it's a very sometimes it, it can be strange if you look uh, from outside on uh, on those uh, small group of people. But perhaps it's something like like if you if you if you assist to a discussion of I don't know some make uh, some Surgeons, you know, uh, surgeons, you, 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 you can't enter in their way of, 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 of looking to the human being, but uh, it's something special. And when exactly, do you remember the moment that Auschwitz became your mission? Oh, I never wanted it, you know, uh, uh, some very important survivors, very important for me, proposed me to... Uh, I am a medievist, you know, I, I, was, I was working on the early Middle Ages, on the 10th, 11th century. It was a, I think it was a f sort of way to escape from the modern and contemporary history. But when they asked me, uh, I was thinking about it two or three weeks, and I understand that I cannot say them, no, I don't want, I want to stay in my early Middle Ages. So I accepted it, but it was a little bit against myself. Uh, and the first three or four months, I was more listening, looking, you know, I was uh, just capturing, let's say, the, the sense, the pulse of the, of, the, of, of the site before taking some, some, some first decisions. Yep. Uh, because everything that you can change, even if you are thinking that it will be something better, something more, let's say, I don't know, clear for the new generation, it may change also, in a part, let's say, the, the signification or the, the comprehension of, the, of this site to, to the new generation. So, so, so it, it is something that you feel this responsibility, you have to discuss with many people. It, it's not, you can take this decision as a director, but you have to really think about for a long time in order to not make this place more um, obscure, more, more Inunderstandable, no. let's say, to, 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 to the people to the who come there, yeah, to, to the, the visitors. visitors. So, so, you know, it's really a part of your life if you are thinking all the time about all the things that you have to do to change, to, to make it better, to make it different. And, and if you discuss with so many people, uh, yes, every movement. Yeah, I understand. Maybe we can, let's have a close, there's a picture of Auschwitz in your book, maybe you can see it. And then, it's maybe good, I would say it's good to explain to the audience the differences, and maybe you can do that, hopefully, uh, between Auschwitz I, the Stammlager, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, where most of the guessings took place, and then Auschwitz III, where the uh, satellite camps were, Monowitz, among them, where Primo Levi worked. So what, what exactly do we see here? So here you see the, 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 the western part of, uh, of the city of Oświęcim, and the village of Brzezinka, with between the two places you have a railroad, probably one of the reasons of the implementation of the camp at that, at that place, because it was very well connected with uh, the entire, let's say, central or eastern uh, Europe. Uh, at the top, uh, on your left, 
you see uh, some very similar buildings. This is Auschwitz I, uh, built on the basis of a, of a pre-war military chasm. Uh, some bigger buildings, a little bit on the right, there are some factories, German factories that were implemented in the site since 1941, uh, 42 mainly, uh, to use the, the work of the, of, the, of the prisoners. And on the right, when the sun is coming, you see the enormous place of, of Birkenau, uh, built, yes, some starting to be built, let's say, some two years after, after the, the beginning of Auschwitz I. You don't see Monowice, who is uh, three or four kilometers uh, to the east, and you don't see, of course, uh, 49 or 50 subcamps that were surrounding all the, all the area. Um, and uh, in this part of Birkenau, completely at the west, surrounding by some trees, you have the most important uh, relics, some most important ruins of the crematoria in gas chambers number two, three, four, and five. Just remember, remind us, how many people were killed in Auschwitz? You know, we are, uh, let's say, certainly not less than 1,100,000, and certainly not more than 1,300,000. But because uh, Germans do not count every transport at the arrival, we don't, historians are not able to give a more precise, yes, someone were giving some more precise, but it's still discussed by, by, by historians because the archives are not uh, entirely uh, uh, saved un until now. They were burned. They were burning all the archives before they leave, uh, before the, left, the, yeah. the Red Army arrive. And 90% probably of the archives of the camps was destroyed at that time. So we are still in the philosophy of a reconstruction of, of, of the factography, of the history, of the big numbers of, of all those history. Uh, the transports coming from the Western Europe, like from here or from France or from Belgium, they were counted uh, as a starting point in Mehelen or in uh, at Rancy, in some other place. And we have the archives from those places. But transports were, that were coming from Poland, from Hungary, from, uh, from Slovakia, from, even from Ukraine, the western part of Ukraine, they were never e even counted. So, so, so there are not registers of those transports name by name. Yeah. And about you, in one of your books, um, I think it's in, in uh, Auschwitz, a monograph on the human, you uh, mentioned that uh, 70,000 people worked there. No, no not, not here, Auschwitz. 70,000, uh, it's a number of SS who are working on the whole system of the camps. 70,000. In Auschwitz, it was a different period, let's say. It was it starting with a small group of 1,000 of SS in, in 40, and it ended perhaps in... In, uh, in summer 44, some 4,000, 4,500, uh, at least close to 10,000 SS were going through, let's say, uh, Auschwitz, a different period, of course. But 70,000 is a number that uh, we're working in, in the whole system of camps. And what is very interesting is that among those 70,000, 1,650 or something like this were sentenced after the war. And the clear majority received two, three years of prison, not more. So in order to kill more than a million people, you just, you need 10,000 perpetrators? Even less, I think. Even less. Even less, because many of them have got some, uh, so, so, some different roles, let's say. To the really machine of the, of the killing people, it was, it was not a very big yeah. group. Let's have a look at uh, part of the... Uh, movie Shoah by Claude Lanzmann from 1985 and there we will see Philip, Philip Müller speaking and this will be also introduction to his work and his person. Yes, Philip Müller was one of the few survivors of the Sonderkommando and of those who survived the Sonderkommando, one of the few who uh, wrote about his experiences. And maybe I, to those who 
don't know exactly what a Sonder Commando is. Could you explain? Yeah. Sonder Commando, a special commando if you prefer, uh, it was a group of prisoners, a different numbers uh, in different moments, of course, uh, that were obliged to, first of all, help, excuse me, the world, uh, those who will be killed to take out uh, all, the, all the clothes, to make them enter, to encourage them to, to, to enter to the, to the gas chambers, uh, after to pick up those clothes and to take them out, uh, and after the, the Cyclone B was injected and after the, 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 those people were killed, they have to take those bodies to cut the hairs to the woman, to take the teeth uh, in gold, to, to take all the bijoux that uh, can remain uh, on, on those people, and to burn them. And after to evacuating to to, to evacuate the 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 bodies the, the, ashes, the ashes the ashes to to, to to some rivers or to some lakes in the in the uh, in the in the region uh, for that they were separated from the others um, prisoners in the camp they received a little bit better. Uh, things to, to eat, they, they, because they were in a, in, a, in a very critical, let's say, uh, psychological situation. They were shocked, as, as Philip explained it. It, it, it was, a, for them, they were feeling that they are somewhere else between the life and the dead without knowing where they are, really. Uh, so they received some, a little bit better conditions. Uh, however, it was for them absolutely impossible to go back to some other work in the camp. Philip Miller, it was an exception. He arrived during a short time to be in, in Monowitz, but in general it was impossible. And they were thinking, and I think they were right, that they were, their destiny is, is to be executed uh, at the end of this work in order to, 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 to keep the secret about, about all this. Yeah. yeah. So it was one of the commando in the camp. Every prisoner has to work in a commando, but certainly the, the, the most critical, the most tragical, the most uh, uh, terrific one. And they knew that, of course, they can commit a suicide, for example, but it will not change anything because they will take another one. directly another one. And uh, yeah, so the situation was, was very critical. And they did a, 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 um, Insurrection, a sort of revolt uh, in, in, in 44. Some of them, two of those four uh, crematoria in, in Birkenau, uh, they were all killed. But among those two others that did not participate for, for different reasons in this in this uh, uh, in this revolt. Um, some one, nearly of, uh, close to 100, I think 96 arrived to the end of the camp, that mm -hmm. means to the evacuation, to the, to the march of the dead. 96 of 96 the almost 2,200 so members of the Sonderkommando, correct? 96 arrived yeah. to the... To the survived, to, yeah. so survived until the, the, until the, the dead march. Yeah. Uh, we are not sure about the, the final results, because the, we are in, in January 45, the end of the war is in May. They arrived to Austria, to, to some camps in Germany. Yeah. Uh, they were in a little bit in a better condition, because they received a better food in Auschwitz. But uh, so probably many of them survive if something tragical didn't happen. But only, only a few of them uh, wrote their memories yeah. after the war. I remember three books, I think three, and one book with uh, collections of some uh, 10 or 12 interviews. I think that's all. Primo Levi, as you know, um, argued that the most demonic crime of the Third Reich, of the Nazis, was the um, existence, was the creation of the Sonderkommandos. And he wrote that was an attempt to shift onto others specifically the victims, the burden of guilt, so that they were deprived even of the, the solace of innocence. Would you agree with Primo Levi that this was the most, that the Sonderkommando was the, was the 
most demonic part of the whole endeavor of the whole killing machine of the Nazis? I don't know. I think we have to, to replace the, the words of, of, of Primo Levi on, on a very long discussion about the Commando after the war, starting with some very critical and very, uh, I, I think, too critical judgment of, of, of uh, Hannah Arendt, for example, or, or some others, who, who treated them like a quite co-responsible of those killings. That was completely false. They didn't kill, they, they were obliged to do this work, as in some other commandos, some others were obliged to do some other works. There were people who were helping uh, Josef Mengele, for example, in some other part of Auschwitz, uh, because they were doctors and they were obliged to help him. You know, uh, there were capos, there were some other prisoners who also did, did some terrific things because they were ob obliged. So, I think that in those words of Primo Levi, I, I hear a little bit this discussion of, of the past decades about, about, let's say, a sort of, of judgment not only of the situation of the Sonderkommando, but also on their, let's say, involvement. That is, for me, a, a perspective that we have to avoid, to, to, to avoid and to let for the, yeah. the past decades. Yeah. I think now the understanding after those three books and those interviews yeah. of the Sonderkommando is completely different and, and certainly more approach of the reality. Yes, it was an infernal part of Auschwitz perhaps the most infernal, but it was not the most, let's say, let's say it, it was not, let's say, something that, from the moral point of view, engage the people yeah. of the Sonderkommando. No, I would say, and yeah. also Levy wrote it, wrote it somewhere, that we cannot judge the Sonderkommando. They beyond. wanted to, be, uh, to, to rest alive like, yeah. like, like all the others, yeah. and, and they have absolutely no chance to, to escape from this commando. Yes. But you, you, in your book, uh, in the two of them, but also here, I feel a quote here, you, you judge, uh, you, you say, and of course, this is, you're not the only one, that some prisoners cross the border between, and I, I quote, between victim and perpetrator. And then you mention a few jobs, the average block overseer or capo. There you can say this is, this is not mm -hmm. a victim anymore, but a collaborator. This is, uh, you know, I, I tried not to judge, I tried to explain. Yes. It's not my, no, my that's, that's, his, I, I like historians that. do yeah. not have to judge. No, I, I I'm totally on your side. Uh, yes. But yes, some, some of those uh, prisoners certainly uh, transgressed some limits, yes. They, 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 uh, they receive a power an authority and a power and some tools to exert this power, and they exert it with brutality. But their judgment is, so, some of them is, is very difficult because you don't know what was the risk that they uh, have to take before they accept or refuse this, uh, job. this job. Uh, you don't know how they, let's say, psychology changes in that time, and Auschwitz was a world completely different. You, 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 you really cannot judge, uh, let's say, the, our the, the, the psychological evolution of some people in, in this situation. Uh, not everybody was prepared to, to have some authority on some other human people also. Uh, not everybody were coming from a ethically, let's say, well-educated world. Uh, and there was also a play, a very dark play between the SS and, uh, and those uh, prominent, and as, uh, as they were called, those SS um, chief of blocks uh, uh, and, and the capo, uh, especially in the last two years when the, when the transport of, of the Jews from all around the Europe arrive, they arrive with things that have some values in the sweet cases. So there was a sort of black market between those chief of, uh, of commandos or chief of blocks and some of the capo. So it was really a, a very dark and very, very difficult to, to, to analyze world when the sources, after all, are not, uh, are not very numerous. We have many not very, excuse me, numerous. Uh, we have v many uh, memoirs or, or testimonies of normal prisoners, just 
a few of the prominent uh, 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 of capo or yeah. of uh, or of chief of blocks and from the SS, there's nearly nothing, really, really uh, three or four, let's say, uh, memoirs uh, written in prisons and in order to a little bit uh, washing themselves. Uh. Yeah. I guess this is a good time, a good moment for Anna to read the first part of Philip Miller's memoir, the first excerpt. Good evening. Good evening. Armed SS men now led us to the pit. In broad daylight, everything looked quite different. The 250 or so dead bodies did not even half fill the pit. Their staring eyeballs protruded from their sockets. Their swollen lips seemed to be covered with a bluey red membrane. We were fascinated by this horrible manifestation of death and somehow even attracted, as though we were a part of it. But before we had take time, sorry, but before we had time to take in this picture in all its gruesomeness, there was a hail of blows accompanied by shouts of, come on you, get down there you shit, get going. Get those stiffs in a heap, right in the middle of the pit. Driven on by blows, we leapt over the excavated clay into the pit, right among the corpses. I sank down in sticky, slimy mud, and after a few steps, my clocks stuck fast. While we were trying to carry out their commands, the SS men stood round the rim of the pit, constantly threatening and exhorting us. Some were waving their loaded pistols to lend more emphasis to their threats. I waded through the sludge to where a dead woman was lying at the edge. But when I tried to drag her towards the middle, her slippery hand slid out of mine. I stumbled and fell face down into the mud. With great effort, I managed to get up again. My lips were tightly pressed together. I wiped my eyes and slowly opened my dirt and crusted eyelids. My companions had not fared any better. They, too, were covered from head to foot in mud and slime. After some delay, two SS men were lowered into the pit on ropes, while Almeyer, Schwarzhobel and Gestapo Chief Grabner were running about like startled chickens. They conferred together, waved their hands and shouted at us, if you don't get this job done, you yitz, you'll be sorry. The dead no longer cared where they lay on top or underneath, at the edge or in the middle of the pit. Nor did they mind that we were in trouble because of them, as we tried desperately to fling their slippery bodies into this abyss of death. The water in the pit began to rise again. The mud, doughy to begin with, now turned into a thin mush, which made our work even harder. Two of the prisoners could not go on. Completely exhausted, they lay at the edge of the pit, trying to catch their breath and regain their strength. The face of one was encrusted with gray mud. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, Piotr, in your books you write, um, you quote in the monograph, you quote an author that's um, very dear to me, Tadeusz Borowski. And you quote him, the quote goes, that's a camp law. People going to their death must be deceived to the very end. That's the only permissible form of charity. And in your other book, you explain a bit how the deception works, that the deception had two allies. The first was the system that the victims, mostly Jews, were traveling with their families. And this prevented, with the elderly and the children, and this prevented the able, capable 
young men and women to, um, to resist. Or to jump from the train. Or to jump from you the train. You can't lose, uh, let, let, let your, your, your kids, you know, in, in a train uh, uh, and save yourself. It was, it was something that was really organized like this for, the, for that reason. There was a few escape from the trains, in fact. Because people were traveling with the family. In general, yes. In general, there were yes. some transport, uh, some different transport, but in general, yes, the, 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 the rule was, yes, by family. And many of those who survived explained after in their testimonies that they were thinking how to escape of this train, but they can't lose the old parents or the small kids in, in the train alone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the second ally you mentioned is hope. So much that as in Philip Miller's write in his book that even the, the, the victims in the family camp, the so-called family camp part of Auschwitz, mainly they came from the other concentration camp to Regenstadt, when the moment when they were told that they were, that they were going to be terminated, that they were going to be killed, even in Auschwitz, where they, have been for, where they had been for several months, maybe even longer, they couldn't, they wouldn't believe it. They said, no, they're not going to kill us. We were promised, the SS promised us work, another life. So even, can you explain what, what... Even in our life, when we are facing some danger, we are immediately uh, looking for some hope. And we prefer this hope, because this hope brings us, let's say, some perhaps positive uh, solution. So, so we are searching for this hope, and we are, we are, we are really uh, catching it very, very, very strongly. So in this extreme danger, in this situation of uh, everything is done by running, everything is too quick, everything is ununderstandable, everything is unclear, everything is uh, dangerous, let's say it was enough to give some very, very small pieces of hope from time to time. For example, to put on the uh, railway rampa uh, a car with a clear sign of the Red Cross. Ah, many of them were thinking like this. There is a Red Cross here. So perhaps they were right. We were going to work somewhere. Yeah. Or if, if not, why? What, what the Red Cross will, will do there, that, that, uh, in that place? Uh, or, you know, uh, before the entrance of the gas chambers, telling to all those transports, um, put well your shoes together in order to find them quickly after you're going to have to take your bath. Or to give them some small pieces of uh, middle soap. 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 You know, because they are supposed to go for a bath. You know, and, and some small pieces, uh, pieces of, of hope in this critical, very stressive, very anxious situation were more, let's say, credible for those people uh, than, the reality. than the reality that you can analyze. But, uh, but, but you want this hope, so, so you choose this hope. Uh, yes, the hope was one of the methods. So if you want to deceive people, just give them hope. No, it's not even... If you don't let them any hope, they will revolt. They will fight. Only then? Of Only course. Then. If you look at Treblinka, at, uh, at Sobibor, or in the history of the Sonderkommando, yeah. the, 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 the big fight, the big revolt started uh, when there was no, no hope, hope, when yeah. the transport stopped uh, at the end, they understood that they would be killed soon because they saw too much. So at that moment, yes, yes. the fight arrived. Yeah. A fight not to... Even in a sense, the history of the Warsaw Ghetto is the same. It was not a, a choose of a liberty, but it, it was a choose of the way that you want to be killed. Killed or, or, or to die. That was a choice. Yeah. Yeah. And then you... Yeah. But of course, after the war, um, the hope disappeared, and here's a good example in your book again about a survivor, how that worked. You quote, a quote from a book by Harel, my neighbor, Mrs. Kodesh, had arrived there from Wilno with her 15-year-old son. When she saw the children being directed to the left, she, had, she advised him, go with the children. They will probably get a glass of milk. Then in Israel, on the day of her only son's birthday, she took a load of pills. She was 40. She was unable to forgive herself for sending him to die. 
it was uh, quite common experience for those, especially mothers, because uh, the kids uh, under 14 was standing in the colon of mothers and, and children at the selection. And if at the last moment they gather kid to, to, to the grandmother or to some, somebody else, or, or they, they have to convince the kid to go in, uh, in the, let's say, false directions, uh, they cannot, uh, let's say, forget themselves to, 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 to do that. Many of them committed suicide in, in the few years after the war, many. Can we see the second picture? Can you tell us what's this? It's a doll. It's a doll without, without arms. I don't know why. Perhaps it was not enough time to, 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 to doing the arms. A doll that was founded in the terrain of Birkenau directly after the war, uh, done probably with some uh, blanket, blanket uh, of, of the camp. Uh, we don't know anything about anything more about this doll, but it was the only one that was founded in in, in Birkenau. Uh, somebody uh, take it and 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 and, and save it. In fact, some decades in a private house, and uh, and uh, sometimes after uh, I receive it. I don't know, ten yeah. years ago maybe, but it's something absolutely astonishing because, yeah. It's really a, there is really a, a volunty to give a childhood to a kid that has probably no chance to survive uh, among the 200, perhaps 30,000 children that uh, was transported to Auschwitz. I don't know some Some hundreds, perhaps, survived. Those were children from the last transports, yeah. mainly from the Warsaw uh, uprising on '44, yeah. mainly, uh, who, who, who arrived to the to, to, to the end of okay. the to, of, of the camp. Uh, but of course, this 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 uh, uh, only that fact that you wanted to use blanket from the camp to produce a doll, it was absolutely sufficient to execute you by the SS, because you are destroying something that is belonging to, to the Third Reich. So, you know, it, it, it's something absolutely risky, but the goal is to, even in, in Birkenau, try to, to give some, yes, some childhood to, to, to a kid. About the children that were killed in Auschwitz, and you put a number at 200,000 in your book, you start um, with writing, I, I shall say at once, I do not know how to write about it. And then later you write, there is a moment during the visiting of the main exhibition when after passing the exhibits, showing the machinery of extermination, the models of gas chambers and crem crematoria, the room with the human hair, the dramatically looking pro prothesis, the gigantic pile of suitcases, you come to the smallest exhibit of all. In it you see infant clothes, a tiny romper suit, a broken doll, dumb, rubber dummies, feeding bottles. For someone who has become a parent, this is quite unbearable. For a year and a half after my daughter was born, I was unable to approach that exhibit. So the director of yes, Auschwitz... This is something that is completely incomprehensible, you know. Even the ideology, not the ideology is not enough to, 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 to no, how, you know, when you are speaking about 200, I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, kids that were killed, uh, it means children under the 14, uh, age of 14. 200,000. Yeah, 220,000, yeah. Only in Auschwitz. Huh? Uh, you, it's not only shocking for us, because he's touching something absolutely, uh, you know, uh, 
innocent. You have nothing more innocent than a baby of three or four years old. Uh, but it was also something absolutely out of comprehension for the, for the prisoners that were living in the camp. Uh, I was surprised when I was working on, on, on those hundreds or, or more of thousands of testimonies how few of them were speaking about the kids. There's even one Sonderkommando worker who states that he cannot remember. Yeah. Henrik Mandelbaum, uh, he stayed in Poland after the war. He was in the Sonderkommando during one year and a half, maybe. I knew him very, very well. He, we were speaking a lot of time together. And, uh, and he, after the war, he, he was coming in Auschwitz nearly until the end of his life. I don't know how many times, but it was perhaps perhaps yes, thousands of times, not hundreds, but thousands of times to meet some uh, schools, to meet some uh, young people, to, 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 to speak with them. And every time he said, I know that my colleagues from the Sonder Commando told after the war that there were many kids uh, in, in those transports. I can't testify them. I never saw a kid in the transport. When I was working, it was only some adult transports. And he was working in, in 43, 44, during the mass transport of uh, Hungarian uh, Jews, yes. by families, of course. And it was some orthodox Jews for many times. Also, the number of kids was certainly bigger than the number of adults in those transports. But his, let's say, his psychology completely erased the vision of those uh, children, yeah. completely. He every time add that, the others say they were, but I can't I'm, testify it. I can't. You also, uh, there's a testimony by Bertolt Epstein in your book uh, that says a lot about the selection of children. I'd like to read it also because it is a detail that I think is important. During a selection of children, SS men installed a bar at the height of 1.2 meters. All, all those children who passed under it were designated for incineration. Knowing this, small children stretched, stretched their little heads up as much as they could in order to make it to the group of survivors. They instinctively felt what awaited them if they did not catch the bar with their heads. It was uh, different. Uh it's a selection that I, I was that we were presented before on the rampa. This was a selection inside the camp. So the kids that we are speaking were living in this camp from I don't know a few weeks maybe. So they know the rules, even if they do not understand where they are and what the goal of this is. They understand that it's better to be to, to be an adult because you you, you are used. For, for, for work, but that means you are useful. As kids, you don't know uh, what, what should happen. And, uh, and this is yes, something, something very, very important. Imagine the, for those who survived and, and who were there when they've got, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years, uh, the trauma after f for the entire life. We know the trauma of Primo Levi, who committed suicide, suicide probably. Or, Probably, yes. or, 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 some, or some others, but imagine what that means, this trauma, when you are 12 years old, 13 years old, and you arrive and, and you stay, I don't know, two or three months in, in a place like this, that without your parents, because even if, even if they are alive, they are in some other part of the camp, there were some entire barracks for, for kids, uh, with kids coming from different countries, you don't speak any other language that you're own language, uh, so you can't even communicate with some other uh, kids, and you do not understand, let's say, uh, what the adult world wants from you. And uh, I guess the second ex excerpt. The crowd of more than thousand kept pressing towards the exit. Suddenly, Oberschaffuhrer Schillinger, who was first to realize what was happening, grew deathly pale. 
He just stood there, unable to move. This unexpected situation had caught him completely unawares. The crowd was now only a few meters away from him, but he received no help from his colleagues, who had also been taken by surprise. Now the crowd had come face to face with them, while they were still standing there without taking action. They were used to regarding the many who arrived in their daily transports as mere sacrificial lambs. All at once they were faced with a contingency with which they had not reckoned, and it caught them on the hop. They did not look terribly efficient, those hard men. Perhaps they had grown accustomed to regard themselves as more powerful than they actually were. Lagerfuhrer Schwarzhuber, who was standing only a few paces from the exit, was the first to, re was the first to, re to react to the threatening attitude of the crowd. With one leap, he was outside. His determined action had an electrifying effect on the other SS men. They roused themselves as though from a trance and quickly raced to the door where they formed a chain. They knew that Schwarzhuber would rouse reinforcements which would arrive within a few minutes. Now Hussler, his self-confidence fully restored, stepped forward to face the front row of the pressing throng. He tried to stop the people pressing forward by waving them back. But all his gesticulating and shouting had no effect at all. In desperation, he reached into his pocket, drew out a whistle and blew it vigorously several times. The people stopped, somewhat puzzled. Slowly, the noise died down. The shrill blasts on the whistle had obviously scared them and, at least for the time being, diverted them from their determination to get to the door come what may. Fully aware of his initial success, Hustler endeavored to gain contact with the crowd. Now look here, you people, he said. Keep calm in your own interest, do keep calm. When he noticed that his words were ignored, he tried once more to attract attention by blowing his whistle. Again, he began to speak, this time a little more politely. Ladies and gentlemen, but before he could go on, the still half-naked woman suddenly popped up before him, screaming, you want to kill us with gas, I know. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Piotr, we spoke already a bit about, of course, the uprising of the Zonderkommando in the fall of 44, but Müller writes, and this was just one example, often also about small, smaller acts of resistance inside or just before the gas chambers. And there's another example that I like you, that like I, I, I would like to read. It's just a very small part out from the book um, of Müller. A little old man, and we are now in the guest chambers, a little old man had begun to pray the vidu. First he bent forward, then he lifted his head and arms to the sky to beat his chest with his fist every loud and passionate sentence, utter, sentence uttered. Hebrew words echoed across the courtyard. Ashamnu, we are guilty, bagatnu, we have been unfaithful, gazalnu, we have harmed our neighbors, dibani dofi, dofi, we have spoken slander, here we know, we have acted wrongly, we have committed transgressions, we have done evil intentionally, we have committed violence. My God, before I was created, I was nothing, and now, now that I'm created, it's as if I were not created. Dust I am in life, so much more in death, I will praise you eternally, Lord, eternal God, amen, amen. The crowd of 2000 had repeated each of these words in many voices, though perhaps not everyone understood the meaning of this Old Testament confession of sin. Most had kept themselves under control until then, but now tears were running down the cheeks of almost everyone. Deeply poignant scenes unfolded. They weren't just tears of despair. The people placed their fate in God's hands and were in a state of religious ecstasy. 
Yes, it's happened uh, many times, uh, some reactions like this. If we, if we uh, read especially some testimonies of Salman Gradovsky, who was one of the Sonder Commando, he was coming from the southern Lithuania, if I remember well, and uh, he didn't survive the camp. He, he was one of the chief of this uh, revolt of Sonder Commando. Uh, he, he was killed, but before, he was able to, to put some uh, quite important part of literature of, of the camp, uh, some, some uh, uh, two or three, let's say, uh, part of, of, of his remarks, of his, his observation of, I, 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 I even don't know how, how, to, no. how, how to call it, let's say, in the ground. And no. it was uh, discovered after the war. Uh, Salman Gradovsky, and, and, and he, he, he was a religious uh, Jew, and it was certainly very difficult for all the religious Jews to, to see what happened in Auschwitz. It was, let's say, more, I don't want to say more easy, but more according to the religion to be prepared to be killed for those who were directly put in the gas chambers, than for the others who, uh, who who were observing during during weeks and months something that was absolutely uh, uh, you even didn't know how to act as a religious Jew. You didn't even know how it is possible, where is God, and how let's say those things can happen in in, in the earth. Uh, and this is a little bit the tragedy that that Gradovsky is describing and describing and 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 inside many times he he he. Two or three times he, he, he's speaking about those, uh, yes, those reactions of, uh, of those who, at the entrance of the gas chambers, or, or even inside, understood very well that this is the, the, the last moment and they, 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 they have some, some common religious prayer, some, some, yeah. some sort of. But of course, here, uh, not all the 2000, 2000 dimensions, I believe, <coughs> were all religious. That Meaning, the, could, would, would you say, would you agree that, that to me this was also like an, an act of resistance? You know, when you, when you realize that you are at the end of, of your life, I think at this special moment many people become religious uh, in every religion. Uh, you, you are, you know, at the end of something, once again, the hope indicate you that, that it must be something after. So, uh, yes, but it was like this, you know, those people were starting from different parts of Europe, uh, maybe the North Hungarian, the Slovakian, the, the, the Polish Jew, uh, yeah, the, they have some, some suspicions about Auschwitz, uh, they, they, especially in 44, like, yes, they, they have some, some, some let's say, uh, rumors but, but for, for, Jewish, for Jews coming from Saloniki, for example, or, or from France, they were told that they would be evacuated in the East in order to rebuild their life somewhere. And you know, every time this propaganda was functioning, even if the transport was extremely difficult, even if some people died in this transport uh, because of starvation or lack of water or everything, at the arrival, they said, okay, now those who are able to work, they will be okay. separated from the others, you will find yourself next Sunday. You know, okay, you know, they arrive, you have to take a bath because, yes, for hygienic reasons, after this long uh, transport, you have to, to go inside. Okay, it's normal. Uh, and do, do that quickly because uh, the tea or the, or the soup uh, is waiting, waiting for you. At that moment, many of them was applauding. Because after three or four days without water, uh, hearing train, that, yeah. that there's a, a tea that is waiting for us, it, it, yes. But at the end, when they realize that they are going to this bath, women's and men's, this is stranger. Huh? Maybe in our world today, so no, less. <laughs> but imagine you 80 years ago huh? yeah. in, in the religious world. It started to be a little bit stranger. And in general, at the end, yeah. they understood that, yes. Yeah. It, it, you mentioned the manuscript by, by uh, Godovsky that was found after the war, he was killed uh, under the, in the, in the, in, under the, in the earth. Um, 
There's a, uh, Andreas Kilian who, who wrote extensively about the, the Sonderkommando. He um, asks the question, he's a historian, and um, he asks the question why there is a ban on searching for the buried manuscripts of the Sonderkommando? Why we do not more, um, why there are not, not more efforts to find, there must probably more manuscripts. Why? <laughs> It's possible we do not have, let's say, uh, there were some research done, but the research, archaeological research, are done only when, when you enter, let's say, into the ground for, a, let's say, concrete reason. If you if you have to do some preservation work to retain some walls that will, uh, but but. Uh, of course, it it could be possible uh, to, to 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 make a research. I don't know on the ten or twenty hectares. Yes. Imagine, but f first of all, the majority of this terrain was already searched by the Russian Red Army just after uh, the war. Uh, and in the second way, uh, they will provoke an enormous war between the religious. Orthodox Jews and the non-religious, and the rest of the world, let's say. Because you cannot, let's say, move the human hashes that are in this ground, falling from the Shminis, just for a reason to find something. It's, it's, it's not enough for the religious point of view. I, I, I would have some very, very serious problem also for that reason. But it's not the only reason. Uh, those, we, we know how those, uh, on which paper it was written, because we have some, some of those that I find it in the 50s, in the 60s. We know the ink that they use, we know, uh, you know in what, uh, what of kind of, uh, I don't know, so? container, container they, they, they were put in general after 80 years in this ground that is a very, very uh, humid ground uh, with, with a water that appears, a standing water, a normal water, uh, at 30, 40 centimeters in some places. How many manuscripts of, of Sonderkommandos were found after the war? Do you know that? Something like uh, between five and, and seven, I think, uh, yes. But the Gradoski is, for me, is the most amazing one because Really, he, he's in discussion with God. Uh, being in discussion with himself and in a discussion with the humanity, he's in a very deep discussion with God. He do not contest God because he's religious, but he contests the moon. The moon, I know. The moon, yeah. yeah. Moon, where do you, why, why do you have the right to be upon us when something like this arrives? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's very poetic, it's, it's very moving. It's, it's, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of literature that I am unable to tell you what kind it is. It's something a part of all the others, part of the literature of yeah. yeah. There is in your book also, you mentioned now you mentioned God. Um, the Pope comes to Auschwitz, I think it's the former Pope, and he asks the old question, where was God? Benedict, then, yeah. Benedictus. And then a friend of yours who is also a poet and a survivor, he gets very angry and upset about this question because he claims it's the wrong question. The question should not have been where was God, but where was mankind? Yeah, and he left. He, he didn't stay until the end of the ceremony. He left. He was so upset, upset that he, he left, yeah. And what, what would have been your answer to your friend? Hmm? What would have been your answer to this question? No, I, 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 I think he was right. You know, uh, uh, to question God is a very, very easy way to escape about the question about humanity. It's exactly like today. Everybody asks me what we will do when the last survivor will disappear. This is a, one of the two most frequently asked question to me. The second one is, what to do for the new generation will come more uh, numerously uh, to see Auschwitz? This is, those two questions appear in every uh, interview, in every discussion with politicians, with uh, those two questions. So it's about the survivors and the next generations. And what is about us? About us in the middle of that, 
Nobody asked how to do for the parents who would, would come uh, understand more visiting Auschwitz. No, no, this question did not appear any, any time. This is an escape question, of course, about the survivors and about the new generations. It's an escape. And the question of God is also an escape. To avoid the, mo the most painful questions. Yeah. Where I am in this history. Anna? Anna, excuse me. In the evening, a few trucks piled high with corpses arrived at the crematorium. We were shocked to see that the 250 dead were in fact fellow prisoners who had worked in crematoria two and three. Their prison uniforms were soaked with blood and riddled with bullet holes. Later I learned what had happened to them on the previous day. When after the attack on the SS men in crematorium four, the siren began to wail. Only prisoners not affected by the selection were on the site of the crematoria two and three. Seeing the flames leaping up and hearing the shooting, the men believed that they too were in serious danger. To begin with, Russian prisoners of war seized their hated chief Capo and burned him alive in one of the ovens. In the meantime, other prisoners were trying to get hold of the Kommandoführer with the intention of making him suffer the same fate. However, he had grown suspicious and escaped when subsequently they saw armed SS guards approaching and beginning to surround the two crematorium buildings, they decided on a breakout. The three hand grenades and the arms organized over many months were hastily taken from their hiding places. With insulated pliers, they cut the barbed wire in several places, whereupon a large crowd intent on escaping pushed through. Meanwhile, SS guards were converging on them from all sides. Suddenly, someone threw a hand grenade at the SS. As it went off, there was great confusion among the SS men, for it had caught them completely unawares. The prisoners took advantage of this moment of surprise to escape through the holes in the barbed wire. Some did manage to break through the outer cordon and to make their way for a few kilometers in the direction of Rushko. Very soon, however, they met with resistance from SS troops in the neighborhood who had surrounded them. The fugitives barricaded themselves in a barn. There was a violent gunfight during which the barn went up in flames. The fire spread so rapidly that the fugitives were forced to quit their refuge and face the enemy in the open. Although they used every weapon at their disposal, it was an unequal fight. The SS being armed with machine guns and other automatic weapons. Thus the rebels had no choice but to fight to the last cartridge. The few who had survived the massacre, although gravely wounded, managed to report with satisfaction that they had killed or wounded several SS men during the gun battle. It became known later that when awarding the Iron Cross to several SS men, the Lago Commandant had mentioned that this was the first time concentration camp guards had prevented a mass breakout, a feat of bravery for which their Führer had decorated them. About 450 of our comrades had died during the last 24 hours, although Bush had requested no more than 300 names. But these 40, sorry, these 450 men had fought bravely and died honorably, refusing to resign themselves meekly to their fate. They had been ready to defend their lives to their last breath a unique event in the history of Auschwitz. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Müller describes here the 
the, the uprising of the Thunder Commando. Um, what's, what I found also interesting in his book is that, that there was this, he describes the organized resistance that consists also of uh, Russian POWs, prisoner of wars, and uh, Polish resistance, of course, and that was always, it was always postponed. First, the resistance, the, the uprising was going to take place in the summer and then late summer. Mm. And then, and of course, this is for the members of the Zonderkommando extremely frustrating because they know that. But even among them, there were different position, positions on, the, on this. Uh, you know, for the Polish Jews who are in the Zonderkommando, the main goal was to escape, to make a revolt, yes, but in order to escape. Because after, if they arrive to escape from the camp, they speak Polish. They can, they can see, you know, in this terrain between Silesia and uh, the region of Krakow, there are many villages that was German and villages that was Polish. They, they can recognize which village is German and which village is Polish. So they, they can have help. They can receive some, some help. The, the idea, the main idea was to escape. For the Greek Jew, even if you escape, you don't speak Polish. You even do not speak Yiddish because you you you, you, are, you have you are, Ladino, yeah. you are you are Ladino. Uh, you, you, how you can cross Czech Republic, Bohemia, and yeah, uh, how you can check Austria, this part of Germany, all the Balkans, you have no chance. Escape is not a solution for you. So they wanted to to make this uh, this revolt in order to destroy the the, the infrastructure. Uh, of the gas chamber. Uh, so it's a completely different goal from a strategic point of view, a, a different strategy, a different tactic, and a di different tools that you have to, 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 to use. And there was a long discussion among the, the both groups because uh, for the Polish Jews, it was completely not the, the sense. The sense was to, to, to save themselves in order to tell to the world, yes, there was uh, all this entire, let's say, idea behind, yeah. but, but the goals were completely different. So, so not only, let's say, the camp was uh, unable to, to, to follow, let's say, this uh, idea of, uh, of, of revolt, yeah. of, of fight, uh, but even among yeah. them, uh, yeah. and, and for, the, for, the, for the Russian POV, an escape, they, they, they tried to escape, but it was even more complex because they knew that if the Russian front will approach, the Soviet front, they will be considered yeah. outtreated. Because they were not fighting until the end. They are considered traitors. Yeah, by, traitors, by the, yes. And probably they were killed by, the, by their own by Stalin, army. Stalin, by Stalin. Stalin. It was yeah. very, very clear. Yeah. So, so, yes. In, in your books, and also this is clear also from Muller's book, that, that among the victims there was also a hierarchy. And um, you quote another survivor of the, uh, his name has already been mentioned today, Venezia. And you say that Venezia, Venezia said that there was solidarity only when you had enough for yourself, otherwise you had to be selfish if you were going to survive. And of course, there are many more statements like this to be found. But also in your book, there are statements of survivors who say that surviving was impossible by yourself. You had to depend on others. So there are two different takes on ways of survival. No, they were some very, very different, let's say, tactics uh, to survive, to, to adapt yourself or to, or to, or to try to, to, to stay alive in the camp. Uh, we just published a book one year ago. It's only in Polish now, but it will be, it will be translated, uh, I hope, in the, in the next time, about those, those tactics of uh, adapting, surviving, uh, let's say, uh, Yes, it's very difficult to, to uh, where adapting is, 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 is a bad word and when, when it's uh, a goal to, to try to survive. Uh, but but were, mean, I bet where adapting becomes immoral? Or? Yeah, uh, immoral, I don't, I don't want to, uh, to, to okay. say what is more well, uh, immoral, but when adapting means uh, accepting the camp and, you know... Uh, but in order to survive, you have to accept the camp in a way, or not? You have to accept it's not, it's not enough, you have to play with it. You have to play with it. You have to find some way to, 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 to yes, to, 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 to find some, in general, those who survived a long time without being uh, among the couple or among the, uh, among the, yes, this, this uh, aristocracy of, uh, of the prisoners, they were obliged to find some, uh, 
like with this black market, let's say, to, to, to organize something in order to build a position that this position will be serving to some others who they will have in their profit, they will protect you. you know, uh, yes, it, it, it was something absolutely incredible. That's why some, uh, some people from, from the, let's say, very lesser uh, class of the society uh, were more, I don't mean, uh, let's say, from... Uh, Lower class, team. working class, maybe? Yeah. No, no, even less. Proletariat. No, not even no. less, but criminal. Yes, yeah, some criminal people before the war right. have certainly more possibility to survive than people from the country. Or intellectuals. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, because they didn't even imagine that you can play with a system. But to me, playing with a system doesn't sound by nature criminal. Uh, if the goal is to survive, and if the system is, uh, is, uh, is uh, something that is criminal in itself. We are all playing with a system. Not at the same they, level, I think. No, not the same do. level, of course, no. but still. And the system are not the same. Of, of, that's very important. Yeah. That's also... I'd like, to, because part of your job is, of course, to, to do the culture of remembrance. And, and um, I'd like to read again something from your book. The deepest meaning of remembrance is prolonging the existence of those, those who are gone now, who are now gone. But remembrance is also a form of empathy, putting us on the side of the victims with a deep sense of opposition towards the perpetrators. Too late and in hindsight, but nonetheless. Remembrance is an expression of horror, sadness, and respect. Remembrance is owed to the victims, that's true. They deserve our remembrance like nothing else. But today, that's not really they who need it most. It's we and our children who need it. Much more than we realize. What, why do we need it so much, we and our children? When there was this enormous discussion about the negationism, about the deniers, especially in Europe in the late 80s or early 90s, uh, I think the biggest mistake in the conclusion of the discussion was to consider that remembrance is equal to the knowledge of facts, historical knowledge. It's not the same. You know, you can learn the history, you can learn the dates, the facts, the numbers, even, even the, the, the transports, everything, the name of the SS. It's still not the remembrance. Remembrance is something certainly more. In some, it's something that brings this past as a common experience in our today's day, days in order to make us more reflective, more responsible, in order to give us also, I think, a sort of moral anxiety about our own choices. This is a remembrance. It's, you know, like, like a small kid, remember that he did something wrong. He takes some, I don't know, some... Uh, Matches. Matches. And he burned himself a little bit. He will not do that a second time. So the purpose of uh, remembrance is to make us anxious about our own Moral choices. moral choices. You, you don't like moral, moral relatives, Yes, yeah. about our way, way, way to act or our way to stay bystanders. Yeah. I'd like to show one last video and then I will open the discussion to the public. This is a video I, sh I saw it for the first time when I went to a museum a few months ago in Vienna. And it's um, called Dancing Auschwitz. And it's made by the Australian artist Jane Corman. Um, yeah, we see. In your book, um, you mentioned that you couldn't care less how people are dressed when they come to Auschwitz, whether they laugh or not. Laughter is a nervous reaction. This, this video was quite... Um, some people really loved it, other people found it distasteful. Would you say that there are forms of remembrance that, that are not accepted? Is this... What's your... If you see this... So only a few images from this video was done in Auschwitz. Uh, the majority was done in Theresienstadt, in Dachau, in, in Krakow. Mm, they didn't inform us. They arrived early in the morning and they did that well prepared. So they were survivors among them, so it was difficult yeah. to react. Uh, 
it was an idea of those uh, grandchildren, of course, no, not of the survivors who, as we have seen, uh, even did not every time understand what, what he has to do uh, in this video. I remember it provoked a discussion among, among the survivors, some important survivors, members from the International Auschwitz Council that I remember very well. And I think when, I think it was Israel Gutmann, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Gutmann, uh, at that time the chief of the historical research uh, in Yad Vashem, he looked at this video and he, he said his reflections, if he think better to, to have surviving than those who didn't, and he didn't finish this sentence. If mm, this, if yeah, if if if, if he think himself, himself, let's say better, better or. or yeah. But that's, is that what you, uh, yeah, that was not It's a reaction of yeah. Gutmann. He was in Auschwitz. I do not yeah. have to judge this no, one. No. I do not have to judge Maybe Gutmann we should also. Not. But, that's, but yeah. I will tell you that among the survivors, I didn't see many voices. I didn't hear many voices that uh, was uh, enthusiastic uh, about this film. Um, more um, more uh, among the, uh, the, the younger generations, right. yeah. That so makes sense. Uh, if you read the last testimony in this book, you will maybe uh, have a, 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 the, the really last one. There you, go. you will have the, 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 the pulse of what I, I'm speaking about. Yeah. Erot. Why me? How can it be explained that I personally survived? Why is it that I'm still alive? I can't answer that question. I have no satisfac satisfactory answer, but plenty of hypotheses and many more still unanswered questions. Mm, in general, I think a great majority of survivors, because what they saw, because what they did, because what they felt in the camp, felt until the end in some way, I don't want to say responsible, but uh, uh, yes, uh, it, it was not easy to be a That's survivor. Because mm. of the survivor skills. Yeah. So I, I do not see that in this very uh, funny and, uh, and joyful uh, movie. It was not my experience of, of survivors uh, that, that I knew. Yeah. At six o'clock, I know we have to leave in 15 minutes because another event is going to take place here. Are there any questions? I'd like to give the audience the possibility to ask questions to Piotr. Uh, Veronica is going to walk around with a mic. And keep it short and, and say your name, please. Hello, my name is Anna. I came from London to listen to this. Um, oh. I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about culture of genocide today and not just in the past. Thank you so much for the most insightful and deep conversation and thoughts. But perhaps... Uh, with your experience of um, massive experience of the past and educating the present generation, you would be able to answer the question I can't find the answer to, why we now have the re-education camps for Ukrainian children, why we have the orders to exterminate civilians in the 21st century and the mankind is watching. Perhaps you could answer. Thank you. It not started with Ukraine. I started with many other places. Cambodia, Rwanda, after the war, I mean. Uh, Srebrenica. Yeah, Rohingya, now the Uyghurs in China. Uh, Ukraine is now, it's very close, so we, so we look at that in a, a little bit different way. It's something that concerns us more than the Rohingya, for example. Uh, yes, and when I was looking on the silence of the world about the Rohingya or about the Uyghurs, 
it was for me extremely stressful because this is a, how you can measure, let's say, your own work. If after 17 years of work, I've got, I don't know, two journalists who are coming and asking me about, about Rohingya uh, after six, 50 or 60,000 already of them were killed. Uh, that means maybe that my message is not enough elaborated. But with Ukraine, it's maybe the first time in Europe that I have the feeling that something starts to work. Not because we are trying to help, but because in our way of thinking on the help, we are referring to the past. This is really the first, the first time that I see that in a massive way. There were some voices like this during Rwanda, of course, or during, I don't know, Srebrenica. But this is for the first time in a massive way. Also, if I can add some quote from your own book, uh, Epitaph, there you write, uh, the righteous among the nations did not write letters of protest against Hitler. Do not focus on fighting the root cause. Be a minimalist. Help one person, just one. You can always do it. Basically, this is a very Jewish thought, by the way. By helping to save one person, you help to save the world. Um, yeah, there's another question. Ik ben op Goldberg. Ik heb een uh, vraag en dat was naar aanleiding van het feit dat ik... Uh, oh ja, dat ik, zal, ik kan het ook vertalen, ja, ik vertaal, vertaal het. Ja. het ja. Het was naar aanleiding van het feit dat ik in Jeruzalem uh, was en een dissertatie las, waarvan ik de titel niet meer ken. Um, dat ging, een studie van de Hebreeuwse Universiteit, dat ging over het feit dat herinneren gebruikt kan worden als politiek wapen. Uh, waarbij jongeren uh, in hun jeugd op de lagere school door Yad Vashem gaan uh, en nog een keer en ook als in het leger gaan nog een keer door Yad Vashem gaan. Wat is uiteindelijk de oplossing om onze jongeren een vreugdevolle jeugd te geven? Omdat een deel van onze opvoeding is mensen perspectief bieden en ook hen te helpen als ouders om op te groeien naast alle pijn in blijdschap. En dat dat een fundamenteel ding is van ons gezinsleven. Ja, I will translate. Uh, the gentleman said that he uh, went to Jerusalem and he saw, like in, a, in at the university, yes, universiteit, at the research that that remembrance culture can also be used as a political weapon, uh, which of course we all know. And then the gentleman added that uh, part of the task of raising children is also to give them a hopeful and joyful future. And I hope I, I summarized the question um, not uh, rightly, that um, how can we combine, how can we weigh these two um, tasks as educators, as parents, um, how can we remember, how can we keep the remembrance culture alive while at the same time uh, keeping our children optimistic. I hope that this was more or less the question. Yeah, first of all, you don't need to go to Jerusalem to understand that the past can be used by politicians. <laughs> uh, uh, we see that everywhere. And it's incredible, but it's growing. It's absolutely growing everywhere. You know, 90% uh, of time, if I see on the TV or in the newspaper, somebody speaking about history, I'm sure it's a politician. It's not a historian. They are not speaking about astronomy, about biochemy, about I don't know what, uh, but about history, yes, every time. So, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a problem a little bit uh, for, the, uh, for some purity of historical research also. But, yes, you have to, to learn to the kids that the world can be a good world, and peaceful world, and safe world, and this is normal, and we need that, and we want that. But if you do only that, you do not explain them that the risk 
to do something inverse exists. And there is that people do not act, oppose themselves if they see something like this uh, exist. And if you do not oppose yourself in some small things, those small things can very, very quickly become big things. It's what happened every time. Uh, it's not enough to tell to, 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 the, to the kids that, yes, uh, you have a bright future for you. And, uh, uh, you know, I was, I, when I was an early teenager, I was going six years in a, in, in a school in Switzerland. Uh, they really can learn to the young people that the world is beautiful, safe, and fantastic. Uh, but suddenly they realize that maybe uh, those young people need something more in order to, 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 to be able to oppose themselves to what is not safe and what is not beautiful. Uh, and they started with some very, very good uh, lessons that I remember until now about the mass media. How to decrypt, let's say, some uh, propaganda, how to analyze some political text. Well, we've got 14 years old. It was not, uh, let's say, a, a, a very, uh, yeah. You must do the both. If not, if you create only a very beautiful paradisiacal world, they will be not able to, even to build it, but certainly not to save it. Or to survive it. Oh. Another, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, I, okay, first, oh, yeah, I see a hand. Oh, yeah. <coughs> my, na my name is uh, Chudio Bavi. Uh, you can see. <coughs> Coming from the global south, I really want to thank you for this conversation. Coming from Nigeria, I think in many African countries, we really didn't get the type of information and education about Holocaust like I'm learning from you today. But listening to you, there's really a question that is painful in my mind. I will be grateful if you can Give me your own impression on that. Uh, the Holocaust happened on European soil. Why was there no massive protest in Europe? Why was there no massive demonstration in Europe? Mm -hmm. Did people, didn't people know about it? I find it extremely difficult to comprehend on that, listening to you the depth of this cruelty. Why was there no massive protest okay. against Europe? I understand your question, thank you. Uh, the Holocaust started in the end of 31. The ghetto, a little bit before, of course. The, the, the anti-Semitism of the Third Reich in the 30s. The anti-Semitism in Europe a long, long time before. But when the Holocaust, really, the, the genocide started, the mass genocide, 70% uh, of Europe were occupied by Germany, and it was the war in Europe. So, of course, you can do a manifestation. Uh, you can uh, go in 10,000 people to manifest somewhere, you will have 10,000 people killed here by the Wehrmacht and by the SS, and things will go uh, like it was before. I think the question was not about, about the, a, mass, a mass responsibility during that time, but about an individual reaction. Uh, a manifestation will do not serve anything, uh, but if there will be some more individuals who will act, maybe some more individuals will be saved. The only massive reaction to save people, it was Denmark. They've got a few Jewish people in Denmark, and some few thousand, but, but, but they evacuated them all in a very short time, a few nights, to, to Sweden through, through, through boats, through small boats. Yeah, it was, I think, the only one massive. And you also mentioned Bulgaria, of course. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where not on that scale, but something alike happened. 
and aware, of course, acts of resistance. But that's we have we are running out of time in answering more deeply your question. Um, I was so, was seeing a hand over here. Yeah, and then the, this must be the last one. It's the last question. I hope it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure there. No um, pressure. No. My name is Rosan Kropman. Thank you for this program and thank you for the thoughtful conversation. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about your, uh, 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 you, you just spoke brief, briefly about it, about um, history and politics. You've been director since 2006. Auschwitz is a state museum. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the differences um, between progressive and conservative Polish governments in those years? To what extent do you feel the pressure of politics in Auschwitz? Of course I feel the pressure of politics, not only in Poland, but from Poland, but from many other countries, trust me. Uh, but if I ask politician, and I ask it firmly, to not enter with our with their politics in Auschwitz. So some, sometimes it's quite difficult, and sometimes <coughs> I do not have only success. I cannot enter with Auschwitz into the politic. No, it's a question of, of, of method. Of, of If I want to preserve Auschwitz and ask politicians to stay out, I cannot start as a director of Auschwitz to, to comment the, the politics, except some situation like it was uh, two days ago, for example, in Poland, when Auschwitz were used in a, in a political clip, video clip. Uh, in this situation, we protest, of course. But uh, in, in general, uh, I will not give you my opinion on politicians from the extreme left to the extreme right, because that means that I will use Auschwitz and I will use the victims in order to promote some political idea. Mm, I cannot do that. If not, I cannot say to politicians, do not enter with politics in Auschwitz. It's a price. Thank you for this clear answer, Piotr. I think the last question have been, was asked already uh, because of time limits. Piotr, thank you for your conversation. Before we close, I'd like to thank you for being here, for listening. I'd like to mention the name of the Dutch translator who is sitting here in the first row. Um, that's Jan Sietzma. I think you did a terrific job. You can buy the book. Uh, there's nobody to sign it, but you can buy it. That's maybe the most important thing. And I hope we'll see each other again. Thank you. Okay.